Welcome back to the Gallagher Shots YouTube channel. This is Extra Time. My name's Emil Franchi. We've just watched Newcastle United beat Bournemouth 4 1 away from home. Uh, look what? at the faces. Look at the faces. There's a dab going on and everything. Um, we're very excited here. Um, in true fashion, uh, I've got a, a Chinese on the go, so that'll be going cold while we wax lyrical about Alan San Maximan for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, but today I'm joined by uh, Adam Cleary. What coach is Adam Cleary? Thanks for joining us today. We've got uh, Liam, a face behind the amazing account, Dobby Solano. <laughs> uh, and we've also, uh, there you go, Doug, Doug's, <laughs> Doug's having his mind blown here. Uh, and Doug, Doug, what, what's your fame, mate? Chris, Chris told me a little bit about it. What, what's your story? Um, I don't. I, my story is that like, I'm an exiled man who left the North East in 1974 as a little boy and have just been besotted with the club ever since. So I live in Merseyside and I've done since then. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> my boys who are both Merseyside born and bred are as black and white daft as me. So, but, yeah, I think C that's where... Curtains have been closed the last few weeks of the last few days, have they? <laughs> no, not at all, mate. Not round here. We rule the roost round here, mate. All black right, OK. Proud, yeah, loud and proud, mate, yeah. Newcastle on Mersey, uh, I love it. Um, well, lads, um, we've got loads to talk about here, but um, a rampant performance from Newcastle with a with a different lineup in this one. Um, Liam, were you surprised by uh, the team uh, given what happened against Manchester City on Sunday? I was surprised to see Kraft involved. Um, I think we've never really seen anything from Kraft so far to to suggest that he's kind of a Premier League player. But uh, I thought he played well today. I thought, I mean, I don't think anybody played bad. But um, at this point, I think it's just good to, at the minute, it's, we're, we're safe. We're kind of, we're not really looking to push on much more. So I think kind of experimenting with the team. Um, I would have quite liked to have seen Joe Linton and Andy start up top together. I thought he was going to go with two strikers. Um just after the kind of disappointment of the Man City game. But uh, no, I thought, I thought now was the time to experiment. Yeah. Um, Doug, um, we saw Gale in there. Do you think that was vital for his confidence that he started today or, or were you shocked by that as well? I was a little bit surprised, but I think in hindsight, with him getting his goal, to be fair, it's a good, good move really after that miss on Sunday. So can't have done the lad any harm really. I was just surprised in general with the team selection, but... After Sunday as well, you, you you thinking about it, you couldn't be with yourself. Can you swear on it? Wait, swear on. Go for it, go for it. <laughs> so fucking appalling on Sunday. You could have had any eleven out there, couldn't you? And you couldn't have questioned it. But in, you know, after the event, it was a great performance. So fair play, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Adam, I, I mean, the turnaround between the games is, it hasn't been the best right now, but um, it couldn't have been more different from Sunday, could it? Yeah, actually, like talking about the team selection, I was surprised by it. But I was surprised there wasn't more changes because you've got a lot of lads out there now who have played. That's like their fourth game in you know the space of, was it eleven days or something like that, and we looked shagged against Aston Villa. And I know obviously we... the fans weren't exactly busting the lung to get up the pitch against Man City, but there was a lot of tired legs, tired decisions, and things like that. I really thought there'd be a lot of changes going into this. So to see just really Kraft coming in, uh, Gale starting, etc. I thought it was quite, I don't know, almost a, a naive team selection. I didn't think you'd really appreciated how tired players were going to be. And I thought, oh, here we go. It's going to be another very lethargic sort of sit-behind-the-ball display. And then, well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> how long has he had that ready? Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've got my kind of cut. I think I'll join you there. I'll, I'll join you on the... Uh... The, the virgin cans there. It's gone um, all over my laptop life, but it was worth it for the bit. It was absolutely worth it. Um, Newcastle were ramped. That first half was just attack, 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 as the as the famous chant goes. Um, couldn't get enough of it, Liam. Um, I mean, who was the, the standout man in that, that first half for you? <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Alan was absolutely outrageous. Like He was uh, absolutely superb, but I think Sean Longstaff before he went off was uh, he was absolutely full of running. He was playing on the wing a lot of the time. Like you look at the uh, the first goal. I mean that comes from him kind of in the in the kind of right wing position, winning the ball, um, going in brave for the tackle, and then uh, I think he had a really good performance until he kind of obviously I think it was his hamstring. They had to come off with that, but I, I genuinely don't think anybody played bad in the first half or the second. Yeah, it was a it was a vast improvement from what we've seen from Longstaff. He was very much one of those passengers against Manchester City, and 
Uh, Sean Longstaff of late, we spoke about this on the last one we did, um, since the injury just hasn't looked the same player today. We, we saw a bit of that and, you know, sod's law that he gets injured once again. We hope that it's not a long-term thing. Um, but, Doug, to go back to you, you're, you're our Gale correspondent right now. Um, he finished that goal so well. It was it was, it was reminiscent of the goal against Villa. Um, do you think he's out to prove a point with that one? I think, to be fair to any striker, you know, there's so much luck involved in finishing. Your natural instinct is to shoot on sight. It comes to you, you let, you let fly. He did that on Sunday. He caught it wrong. It flew over the bar. He should have scored. He's probably done the similar thing today and it's gone in the far corner. So, any striker, you just want it at the back of the net, don't you? So, I just think we'd, I'd love to see Carroll get one. Um, I don't want any sort of stupid myth creating that he can't score. I mean, we've done it with Joe Linton all season. and But I don't think Joe Linton, you know, I've, I've been as patient as I can with him. I want to stay patient with him. I'm not one for getting on the players' backs, but he's just not a natural goal scorer. I think we all realise that now, don't we? Sort of seven, eight months in, he's just not. Uh, but having said that, I don't think he's a natural wide player. I don't really know what what his role is. Don't want to be negative after a four 0 victory, but uh, but Gale, you know, Gale is an out and out striker. That's his job to put it in the net. So fair play to him. He took that in lovely. Just it was very reminiscent of the Villa goal, wasn't it? The way he found the far corner. Yeah, he's kind of got that difficult angle, took it first time and um, put it straight through him and, and that just set the precedent for the match. Um, Adam, just on Joe Linton there, um, what, what what did you think of having him out on the wing? Do you, do you think this is the, the position that we need to keep him in? Or I kind of agree that I'm not really sure what his position is, but I thought, just on the subject of players who, as well as St Maximan, looked very good, I thought Bournemouth didn't have a clue what well, to do with him. Like The defenders didn't want to sort of push into his area and get him and none of the midfielders wanted to sort of move across either. He seemed to just bully every single person. He was in the he was in the wide areas, in the centre, and I think just not being relied upon to be the goal scorer in this side has really suited him. Um, <laughs> do you think with Gale coming in, you're not going to see a better... You could live to be a million years old. You're not going to see a better example of a player being too good for the Championship and not good enough for the Premier League. A scoring a hard chance against Bournemouth three days after you just missed an open goal against Man City in a quarter-final. Um, I don't know. I do like Joe Litton. I think people forget his age. I think they forget he's he's really young. He's adapting to a new league, a new country, and all like that. And I just, ah, I was really impressed with him. And there's been a lot of games this season where you've kind of had to sort of just lower your voice as you talk about, like, oh, I thought he was quite good. He didn't do anything I could really tell you about. But I just thought, in general, there's a lot of intangibles there with him. So I don't know. I'd like to see him get another couple of goals for the end of the season, but not as much as I'd like to see Andy Carroll get one. I think it's definitely a case of no one expects the Joel Linton Inquisition every time you uh, question his performance. There's a lot of talk, uh, you know, d- not not saying that you're, you're on this bandwagon uh, there, Doug, but I feel like Joel Linton has kind of had that this season where some people want to say, you know, he's done well there, but is he has he scored three goals? I guess it, it's such a difficult one for him, but um, focusing again on on the um, the player that we've signed as well, Sam Maximan, um, I mean... Is it just a case that Bournemouth was so bad today, Liam, or were the things he was doing was was that just showing his his ability so much? I think the uh, the second goal, he just absolutely tortured Adam Smith. He uh, he just absolutely ran rings around them. I think they from the off they were very very poor. They just kind of they've got all the hallmarks of a of a relegation fodder side. It reminded me a bit of like us in the past yeah. when we've gone down and you know like them them f- few games heading towards the end of the season when you go into it and you think like oh, well these have got now to play for these are mm-hmm. safe these aren't doing much this is a game we should get something from and to get absolutely hammered first half and second half it's they just they just didn't look up for it at all they didn't show any real threat um to sound like pods um <laughs> and they and defensively though, I, I I mean, I really rate Nathan Ake. And in in the past, they've always been a kind of solid defensive side. And they were just absolutely dreadful. Well, we are getting close to Notting Hill Carnival, so that might have something to do with the fact that Bournemouth <laughs> lost today. But um, it remains to be seen. Uh, Doug, do you think that this is the bubble burst now for Bournemouth? I mean, what do you make of Bournemouth as a side that's been in the Premier League as one of these Midland teams that impressed but has now fizzled out a bit? Yeah, I mean, they've always surprised everybody, I think, with the professionalism, I think is the word. I like Eddie Howe. Um, I like the way he goes about his business. Um, I've been to 
I mean, last year was the 2-2. We got a great result at the end of it when Matt Ritchie scored. But they're always dangerous. They're dangerous when they come to St. James's. And you look at a team on paper where, I mean, I'm I'm older than you guys. So I'm, I'm not at that age now where I know every player. My lads say, oh, is this, that, and the other. Tell me every player in the Premier League. And I'm having to Google who players are these days. So Bournemouth are one of them teams that don't have any outstanding players. Uh, but they do a job. And I just do think they've probably come to that point there where, where the bubble has burst. And they, they were in free fall tonight, let's be honest, weren't they? They were just all over the place. And as, as I think it was Liam just said then, it was so reminiscent of, of us guys watching our lot um, in recent years when there's just no, uh, there's no coordination, there's no leadership on the pitch. It was just they were all over the place, weren't they, to be fair. But, you know, that don't take away from St Maxim. He's just an absolute joy to watch, isn't he? And him on one side and Miggy on the other... Uh, to me, the, the sort of light in the in our tunnel at the minute, they're just very uh, refreshing too, lads. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, I would say that it was it was similar to when we sent Fulham packing on that final day of the season. We were just rampant against a team that had no chance at all and, and didn't look like wanting to be there. Um, we, we'll mention, um, we've mentioned Sean Longstaff's goal. I think it was pretty well taken, but not many come close to how well uh, Miguel Almiron uh, took his goal, Adam. Um, is that just a, a, a nice, not an end to the season, but a, a nice finish for him, given the, the critics that he's had? Yeah, the Almiron goal was a weird one because it's it was reminiscent of the kind of goals we tend to concede when we're not playing particularly well. Not necessarily this side or possibly even Rafa's side. But arguably, if you go back to that, um, when Bournemouth beat us 3-1 at home, when the McLaren era really felt like it had bottomed out, the kind of goals we were conceding then where it was just a player going... Well, I'll just run at them. Oh, they're not doing anything. I'll just run a bit more. I would probably score from here. And it just seemed so casual. And again, with all the Bournemouth goals, every time one of them went in, nobody seemed that bothered or angry. There wasn't inquests going on despite the mistakes. They were all just sort of going, oh, well, we're going to lose this one, aren't we? It just looked a lot like the, the worst Newcastle side you've seen, which I think is probably indicative of why they're probably not going to fight their way out of this. I mean, their fixtures are terrible for a start, but yeah. there's just nobody in that side with any actual art all about them. Like, I always remember Lascelles coming off against Southampton, I think it was, like, pretty much smashing up the dugout because no one out, out there was trying to help them. There's nobody in that Bournemouth side that's going to do that at the minute. I think they have they were great when they came up. They were really refreshing to watch. They played a really nice brand of football. They were very sort of humbly assembled. There was a very nice story to Bournemouth, but since then... They've just been your rent-a-kit, out-of-the-box Premier League side. Like, every player's cost 15, 20 million. You don't know why they've spent that kind of money on them. None of them are really performing that well. They're falling back on players who they've had since the beginning. And just, it's kind of a sad end to what's been a really nice story in the Premier League. I just, I will say we are talking as if they've gone down tonight. They're only, like, one point off safety, I think, with two other sides who are doing as bad as they are. So they could yet save themselves. But based on that performance, and especially the attitude of it, I'd be surprised. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Liam, do you see that type of rot stopping? I know you said it's reminiscent of uh, the sides that we've seen go down, but how how do you change that apart from Neil Warnock? <laughs> <laughs> He's just been snapped up by Borough. <laughs> yeah, they'll be Definitely. kicking themselves. Um, I think coming into the game, the fact that you look at probably their kind of outstanding player, you you probably got Callum Wilson. I mean, he's not been great this season, but past few seasons, he's out on di- on disciplinary points. He's out because... He's picked up too many yellow cards as a striker, and that's just bizarre. And it, it, this kind of run in at the end of the season <clears> for your striker to be missing for two games because he's picked up too many yellows. Um, you look at just, it's just, yeah, it is a, just a total <laughs> loss for them. I mean, the first goal, uh, you're just absolutely sick if you give that away. Mm-hmm. If you're in a relegation fight and you give that first goal away because you, you're pissing about at the back, mm-hmm. you can't make a simple five-yard pass out. Um, I, no, I, th- I, think this is, I think this is it for them now. Um, a lot of Bournemouth fans are getting on kind of Eddie Howe's back now, saying if, it, if, it, if he wasn't Eddie Howe, he'd been sacked like four times already. I mean, that is a, this is a terrible result. And I, you would think if this was any other manager, they would probably get sacked after, after conceding four goals to Newcastle. Yeah, it's not great, is it? Um... We had, we saw a little glimpse of the, the loan signings today, Doug. Um, obviously, Lazaro got his goal. I think that was pretty well taken. But if, what did you see of him and Bentaleb today? Did, did they kind of convince you that we should be giving them more in the future? Uh, I think physically, Bentaleb, Bentaleb looks a man mountain. I mean, he's an awesome uh, statue, isn't he, in the middle of the park there? But again, he looks he looked certainly when he first came in like he was lacking game time. 
Um, um, I don't really know. My boys rave about Lazaro. They like get him on, get him on. They see the, the sort of flair side of him. I just haven't seen enough um, of either of them really to, to to. I don't know if it maybe. I don't know. I don't know if it's worth. I'd like to think we'll step up and leave players like that behind. To be honest with you, yeah, they've come in to do a job now, but I want to see Newcastle United not even considering players like that and be 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 buying out of the you know the, the, a, a better a better squad, a quality of player really. So I'm not yeah. being harsh on them, but they've not exactly set the world alight. Lovely goal from Lazaro today and the raspberry against the bar. But see, you know, same with Danny Rose as well. They've done they've done okay, but. It's always okay with us, isn't it? It's always like they've done okay and shall we, shall we keep them on? So I've got me negative out on there. So I, I don't really know what else to say about it. No, I think I think it's fair enough. Um, you know, first of all, they are they are loan signings, and, and that's just the way things are. But um, just want to talk about uh, the final person who uh, helped Lazaro out there, John Joe Shelby, back in the team today, Adam. Um, it's been a decent project restart for him so far. <laughs> yeah, um, I was kind of a bit. Uh, nervous when I saw his name on the team sheet because it was Arsenal haven't forgiven him for losing his runner uh, for two seasons ago against Bournemouth and we should have won it or got, got a result there I've never forgiven him for that possibly because I think it's very indicative of just the John Joe Shelby problem of he can play very well he's capable of unlocking doors he can do things that no one else in that team can do but when you just need him to forget about that for a minute and do the hard yards or just do an unfashionable job he tends not to do it but I think if there's genuinely one huge triumph of Steve Bruce's time at Newcastle, you can't just pin on like a hangover from when Rafa was there or the players sort of doing their own thing. It's what he's done with John Joe Shelby because you don't see him constantly playing these 40, 50-yard passes. You don't see him giving the ball away. You don't see his shoulders slumping or him not tracking back when we lose possession. He seems to have really woken up uh, in this stage of his career. And I think, based on the available evidence, you've got to put that down purely to Steve Bruce. He's obviously encouraged them to just, you know, do this when you can do it. You don't got to do it all the time. We've got other players who can who can make things happen. I mean, they've obviously helped having St. Maximan and Armour on around him compared to, you know, that four four two we played with Rafa. It was just him, Diarme, Richie, and nobody else who was really going to do too much. But um, I think he looks like the weight of the world's off his shoulders. He looks free of responsibility. He looks like he's not liable to make a mistake. The ball runs off his feet. You don't assume he's going to jump into a tackle anymore. I think he's been not like he's not been John Joe Shelby in the way you want John Joe Shelby to play. He's not done anything magnificent, but he's been a much better player as a result. I think he's far well, more well rounded. So it's it's less Hollywood Shelby. What we're thinking, like more Broadway Shelby. Uh, off Broadway, I'd say. Oh, not off, getting, just... You're not getting the plaudit. That everybody knows you're putting in some career's best work. It's down a back alley, you get some cheap tickets and he's there doing a one-man show about his life or something like that. <laughs> I'm not too sure. Um, right, well, we, we normally pick a star man. I think on this one, we're all in agreement that it, it has to be San Maximan. So, um, what was his best moment in this game, Liam? I think it has to be the second goal. The second goal when he picks that up. Where, you look at where he picks that up there. And you're like, there's not many players that can do what he did. I thought I, I was worried that uh, VAR was going to chalk it out because I thought he'd taken it over the line. Mm. But his close control is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, mm. And and the awareness to pull that back for Sean Longstaff as well, and to to do all the hard work and then find Sean Longstaff perfectly there. I think that was probably his best moment, but. Pff. You could say pretty much anything he does. I think this is, I think this is the only game that he hasn't done like a little Maradona spin, which is right. But uh, and look what happens—we score four. So I'm stop asked. doing it, Alan. Please <laughs> stop <laughs> showing off. Um, Doug, I, I presume you're in agreement with the the star man for San Maximan. But how, how good is he um, over the years? What what caliber of player for Newcastle would you like clump him in the same crowd as? He's a project, isn't he? Because he's a he's a bag of tricks. You can't deny his skill. What I love about him is that on that second goal, it showed it really clearly. He can gain a yard in two yards. So he knocks a ball a yard past somebody, and he's gained a yard in that in that split second of time. And there's not many people have that. That must be like a, a gift within him. Um, I've seen him do that a few times in the box. There's two yards between him and the line, and he's there and he's whipping across him. So I think I think the, the the raw materials are there for him. He just needs to learn about the English game, doesn't he? And some of the some of the Maradona stuff he tries is is in the wrong area of the pitch and at the wrong time. But there's definitely something to work on there. He just needs to learn his role. I mean, 
He was totally sort of oppressed on Sunday against City, but as they all were, I think the tactics were wrong to just hold everybody back. I, I will never, as long as I've got a breath in my body, understand why you would take that kind of creativity and say, just stand behind the ball. Fuck City, I don't care about teams like that. I know you have to have a plan, but what is the fucking point? And do excuse me, I'm off again. What is the point? <laughs> you have a call over here. I'm going to have to get what you to What is stop. the point? Three months lockdown, waiting for a quarter final to come and then saying, so we'll just see if we can hang on for penalties. Just like, no, let the players go in a cup game. You know, nothing else to lose. So, yeah, set them free. It's Miggy as well. I mean, Miggy's not got the same trickery as ASM, but he's certainly got the pace and the, 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 the engine. So I'd be quite happy seeing them two develop down either side and working working, you know, that being your sort of plan, really. Um, Adam, how, how vital is it that we get taken over now to keep a hold of, <laughs> keep a hold of players of that calibre now? Uh, you'd like to hope, because I think one of the main things about St Maximan is he appears to get it. Like, he seems to really bought into the idea of the club and what it means around here. And all the cliched stuff that we get made fun of uh, by other teams, he really seems to have bought into a lot of that. Like, you, I mean, I've, got him on, I've got him on Instagram and all his kids have got Newcastle kits on all the time. He seems to, like, understand it. Fully. So you'd hope, even without a takeover, there's at least another season possibly two in him. But the thing I can't get away with, how close to the finished product he actually looks for the money we've spent. Like, Patrick Vieira didn't rate this guy. Like, he said, oh, yeah, he's got the ability, but he's ne- he probably never have the attitude or the commitment or things like that to get to the next level. And he's coming, he's one of the hardest workers in the entire side. Like, even, even when it's difficult, even when he's played four games in that short space of time. Like, as much as I enjoyed him snatching the life out of Adam Smith, for that second goal. The bit where he just ran it about 70 yards, took the entire game and the entire Bournemouth team with him and tried to roll uh, Almer on him. It's just something Premier League players don't do. They don't get the ball and run that far with it. And he just he just absolutely loves this. Um, do, do we need to take over to keep him? Yeah, probably. Almost <laughs> definitely. But we do have a bad history of not cashing in on players. And not to bring up that conversation now, but if ridiculous money came in for him at the end of the season... Uh, <laughs> well, there was, there was... Sassier this time last year saying, oh, I'd never sell Sean Longstaff, he's the future of this club. <laughs> and now, you never know, do you? He's having a great season and I'm really enjoying watching him, but I'm not getting carried away. Yeah, he might, he might catch a cold case of Kennedy over the summer or something like that when, <laughs> when we get to the end of it. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Newcastle sit on um, 42 points now. Uh, we're 13th. Um, Liam, is that safety? Yeah, you'd have to say so. You got to got to bear in mind that a lot of the uh, a lot of the bottom teams have got to play each other as well. Um, it would be spectacular if we went down now. I, I thought we as soon as we come off against um, Sheffield United three 0 I thought I was. I mean, going at the restart, I was like, this could be. Uh, if if you'd given me the the option before Project Restart, if we could have just stopped the season there, I would have taken it because I'll just. The Newcastle fan of me just thinks, yeah, we'll we'll get caught. We'll end up going down. We'll we'll get a bad result first game back, and then we'll just free fall. Um, but no, I think I think we're definitely safe now. You've got to bear in mind that, like I say, a lot of a lot of the teams below us. I think we've still got to play like three of the bottom six, maybe, or maybe it's more. We've got West Ham next, and then we've got a, a few more. And you look think... you look at some of their run-ins as well. Yeah, I think West Ham and Brighton are in there, but um, I did say that it's going to be in the first five games that we get the points we need because we've got the the horrid games of Liverpool, albeit end of the season. Tottenham are in there uh, that we still have to play, so it's it's going to be it's going to be weird. But then again, Newcastle towards the end of the season seem to have this resurgence. Is this the best performance we've seen all season, uh, Doug? I want you to just forget the city game for a second, just <laughs> and just and just focus on the league. <laughs> but um, is that the best performance that we've seen from Newcastle this season? You need to remember where I live and where I've lived for forty years. I've got Manchester City and Manchester United <laughs> fifteen mile that way, and Liverpool and Everton fifteen mile that way. So this season we catch Everton. That's what we do this season. We don't stop and we catch Everton. Just so I've got some bragging rights around here, but right, putting that to one side. <laughs> Cast my mind back over the season. It was a, it was a great performance, wasn't it? We outclassed them today. Um, first 30 minutes against West Brom away were fantastic, but then we sort of took the towel in a bit. I can't, at the top of my head, I cannot think of any. We've not scored more than I think, two. I think the, it's the balance. It's the balance which I would say with this one. This is the one where we had the, the confidence performance uh, all the way through. It's something about that orange kit, I think. 
But we <laughs> also we also had no goals conceded. We were against a, a weak opposition, so we just rolled them over. Um, and that's what we should be doing. Whereas I, I, I would say, Adam, I don't know if, if you want to jump in, but like the Tottenham game, for example, where we scored the one and, and then we just sat back and just t- took everything in. Yeah, I think a lot of people are quite quick to jump on this and say, well, Bournemouth were terrible and that's why we've won. And to be fair, the first two goals are Bournemouth mistakes that so they shouldn't be dallying around with it there. Adam Smith gives um, a certain maximum fart in much time and space. But teams make these mistakes all the time and Newcastle very rarely punish them as a result. So to see us do it and be relentless with it as well, not just settle for it at 2-0, push for the third, push for the fourth. We look like getting a fifth at one stage, which is absolutely ridiculous. But I think... Uh, I think realistically, we've been safe since we took, we took those four points off Chelsea and Everton because with the fixtures we had left, those were two of the harder games we had. Taking four points from them was was massive. I don't think we've dropped below 14th all year. I think I'm right in saying we've never really been we've never really been safe, but we've also never really gotten dro- drawn into it, which is normally the problem Newcastle teams have. They get sucked into sort of like 15th, 16th, 17th going in the last couple of games, and all of a sudden it gets a bit nervy. We've been, re- if we're honest, we've been really comfortable all season we've had some bad results we've had some bad runs but we've picked up really important points we have needed to I think getting that win against Southampton going into lockdown was I mean that was it there was no problem coming back I mean we know we're mathematically safe but seven points out of nine on the return is just it's sensational really if we push for the top 10 I mean we're 10 points off a Champions League place as it stands right now <laughs> 10 10 points oh, dear, that... away from the relegation zone 10 points off a Champions League place the thought of Europe just makes me feel sick. Uh, that might be the fact that I've still not eaten this Chinese as well. But um, Liam, um, credit where credit's due for Steve Bruce on this game for the the response uh, after after Sunday. You've got to like. Uh, there's there's been a few times this season where we've been on the end of a hiding, and I've thought this this is like where we go. This is where we go down because under Rafa. You kind of you were never really beaten well in a game. You never really got thrashed in a game. And there's been a couple of times a season where we have. I mean, you look at like five nil Leicester, four nil Arsenal. But you look at those games and you, you when when we got beat five nil off Leicester, it's like oh well, now we're just gonna go on a horrendous run. We're gonna get tonked every week. But in all of those games we've kind of responded and even probably is one of our most disappointing performances against City. I mean, I know it's Man City, but it was a disappointing performance. Um, and to come off the back of that with the confidence that we've kind of shown, it's just, you've, you've got to give them credit, man. Um, I mean, my, my point at the minute is, I think we're three points off Rafa's best uh, to finish. As much as Rafa fact would hate it. <laughs> And what I was thinking about more so was the goal difference side of things, because a lot of times under Rafa, we were kind of, if we set up defensively in a game, it was because we wanted to maintain a good goal difference. And he was always, we were always kind of praised on our goal difference coming in the end of the season. And I think we're about minus 10, maybe. Mm. And I think the best, the best we managed under Rafa was like minus six. So you've got to give him credit. Like I, n- none of us expected to be safe at this point in the season I don't think um, and some of, the, some of the wins that we've picked up which nobody would have expected either um, yeah you've got to give them credit Yeah, um, Doug I, I know that we're saying this was a fantastic performance today but if you had to choose an area to strengthen now based on, on that performance where, where would you still look? Uh, personally I always look at right back I never think we've got the right back situation sorted for I can't, I can't remember how long uh, people are praising Mankio he has done well but he's still prone to mistakes all the time. Yedlin comes in, he's fast, but his positional sense is rubbish. I think Kraft's just not not at that level. Um, I'd love to see a really strong... I'm just trying to think back over the many years. I'm thinking of Irving Natchez in 1972 to 1978. Um, you know, somebody just flying down that wing, and but, but, but also with the capability of getting back there. Help me out here, lads. Think of a good right back. Warren Barton, maybe. <laughs> New That's New always Co- been a position we haven't really. I'd say John Brownlee, but I'm slightly biased. <laughs> John Brownlee, his birthday's on the same day as mine, him, 11th of March. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> it's, it's weird with defenders in Newcastle United that 
it doesn't seem to be until this year and, and recent years where we've had a, a solid defence. But um, I know we've mentioned it on, on a couple of the other extra times that we've done. But um, do you think the presence of Lascelles is, is massive there at the minute, Adam? I think Lascelles has quietly become one of the most important players. I know there was a time last season, maybe in a bit of the season before that, we looked at the depth we had in, that back, in, the, in the back line and we thought, Shaw looks, Shaw looks fantastic. Fernandez looks really good when he comes in. Lejeune looks on a different level. And Lascelles kind of felt like he was getting left behind a bit, maybe only getting in the team because he had that armband. I think especially since we've come back, he looks really, really at it. And I think with Cher sort of showing a few liabilities in his game, Lejeune struggling to stay fit, he's become so important to the stability we've got at the minute. There was a couple of times today where he was just having a bit of fun with the fact we were 3-0 up and pushing forward. But as soon as we lost the ball, he was back in like that. Like, he was so fast. I've also just realised that I could have said uh, Holly Bald for John Joe Shelby's more modest acting career. And I'm oh. furious I've already come up with that now. But Holly Bald, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, both way, both way. Uh, what am I going to go for? Both um, yeah. way. Uh, to summarise, Jamal LaSalle's good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm coming back for a better one shortly. Uh, uh, Liam, uh, we've got West Ham next. Um, they're currently playing Chelsea, and, and they're, they're actually 1-1 at the minute. Um, but um, what do you think for that game? Do, do you think it's going to be a game where we see even more rotation? Yeah. Um, I, like I say, I think I think for, for the last few games, it's there's no harm in experiment with the team, to be honest. Like I say, I would quite like to see jo, uh, Joe Linton and Andy starting up top together. I think the, it's a kind of the shackles are off um, at the minute. I mean, there's no there's no fear now. Um, I think I think it'll probably be a tougher game against West Ham. Um, I think they, I think Bournemouth have kind of resided the fact that they're probably going to go down now. Um, but I would, oh, I would absolutely love to beat them. I'd love to beat them. Um, it's Keegan happening here in the press conference. Here. If, you watch, <laughs> if you watch closely, he's growing grey hair. <laughs> I know. I would. I, I would. Uh, I, I would have given Bournemouth the points today if it meant sending West Ham down with that stadium. It'd have been absolutely <laughs> great. <laughs> so what? Andy, Andy Carroll, Andy Andy Carroll leaves. Leaves. not scored for thirty games, and West Ham are up next. Is it? <clears throat> oh, oh. Tell you what. Tell you what. Um, I think we should obviously just pay respects to, to everyone affected by the, the scenes of Andy Carroll's facial hair being uh, gone now. Uh, yeah, um, the, the source of his strength. We hope it's not the case of uh, Samson. But, um, uh, you know, I like, I like to do these questions. Doug, um, pubs starting to reopen. You walk in, you see San Maximan at the bar. What are you buying him? Uh, what would he have, ASM? I don't, he'd probably have some really weird concoction money that he'd made up himself. <laughs> And probably drink it in a really strange way, spinning it on his hand and stuff. But yeah, I'd buy him anything. He's he's a dreamer. He's absolute. He's a, he's, a, he's a massive positive in in uh, in. A, I can't say a team full of negatives. He's a big plus in the team at the moment. So fair play to him. But I just can I just ask you lads, well, because we touched just just touched on the West Ham thing there. How are you lads? Fa- Sorry, Emil, if I've jumped across. No, crack it. on, please, please go in. Please. I I am finding a real struggle to even not be interested in the game, watching it from home, but. I'm, I can analyse it the way I sort of analyse match of the day or otherwise games. I'm, I'm missing that um, attending side of it and the whole hullabaloo of the match and the passion before. And the, to, to, it, it, I'm watching Newcastle United and I'm, and I'm analysing it and watching them and saying that's good, that's good, and that's good. And I'm celebrating when we score, but it's just not, it's just not what it's all about, is it? For, for me, I, I miss diving on like the nearest person and yeah. and like you know like you know and doing that kind of thing. There is something wonderful. Um, being at St James's Park, when you've not spoken to the guy behind you for the entire game, he said something that's riled you up because he's he's made a comment about Joe Linton's first pass, um, which happened to be the kickoff, um, and and you know, and then by the end of it, you're hugging, you're going around to his for tea, um, you're invited to his daughter's wedding. It, it's just a wonderful experience, I think. And it, to be honest, I think it's a release that a lot of people need right now. I think being in the house and celebrating football just hasn't got that same feeling. No, sorry, I digressed a bit there, but yeah, just no, one... no, no. Did anyone else have any uh, match day experience? <laughs> I think it's. I think it's made me realise that it wasn't so much football I was missing; it's other people and going to the pub because oh. I was. Oh yes, football's back. That's going to feel a little bit normal, but it hasn't felt normal at all. Like having a World Cup schedule for the Premier League, where you you know probably got to sit there on your own and watch it, and if you forget to flip it onto the uh, the channel with the sound, it's just 
like watching CCTV of a of a training ground <laughs> game. It's absolutely it's bizarre. But again, you're not going to grumble because obviously a lot of work's gone into this, and I think we're all very appreciative that it's come back. So a, a, a net positive, but it is weird. In, even in the context of these weird times, football is weird at the minute. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, Liam, have, have you got anything to add just about missing people? <laughs> it's just, <laughs> <Nah>. yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> nah. it's it's very sanitised. It's just, it, do, it doesn't feel quite right. I mean, I'm glad that it's on because it's something to watch. And, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad with the schedule, to be honest. I, I like having a few games to watch. I think playing fantasy football helps a lot because you kind of have an interest in all the games. That's helped me quite a lot through it. But, uh it, it's it's just not the same. Like it's not the same as as going to the match, then coming home, then watching the highlights when you get home, and then watching match of the day, and then watching the highlights the next day. It's mm. uh, nah. It's, it's I always find it weird watching us on TV. Like it just it just doesn't seem right. But um, nah, it's not the same. It's definitely not the same. Back to the three pm blackout. He says for all games, just keep them all in one, <laughs> one time, one day. Nothing different. A purist is Liam. Um, <laughs> But I, I must say, I mean, I said this after Sheffield United, that, that feeling of winning lasts. Um, the, the, the days after Man City, I was dreading because Twitter was just a cesspit of people, um, you know, tagging Richard Mars, Masters in posts saying, please, please look at my, my, my takeover um, and just hoping that he might do something. Adam, my, my thoughts exactly. Um, and, and lo and behold, nothing's happened yet, but it might. It might happen. Who knows? Um, because we're near the end, and I think it's only right that we sneak this one at the end, uh, Adam, I've got to ask you, what's Dan Gosling's beef? Oh, man. Like, <laughs> the guy came to us. Was like, that was, it looked like one of the best free transfer, transfers in football history. This was like the future of the Everton midfield. It was there, Gerard or something like that. And then he just left and we snapped him up. I haven't known he just got promoted. He was going to be he was going to be what we thought Kabai ended up being in the end. And he, I think his only contribution for us was scoring a consolation goal against Man City when we were about 17-0 down and uh, <laughs> getting sent off against Norwich. And that was it. I think people people forget he was around in that season. We finished fifth and got like ten games or something. There's a there's a low, there's an entire range of bizarre stats about the year we finished fifth. Like Danny Guthrie played more games than Czech Teoti, for example. But Dan Gosling was there. He was on the boat. He was witnessing it all. There's an entire alternate timeline you could do where it's all from Dan Gosling's perspective. And it's, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what his beef is. I just think he looks at the career he could have had and tries to pinpoint precisely where it went wrong and goes Chris Eaton. <laughs> and he's got a dartboard. This is ready there. But there's yeah, some alternative universe where Dan Gosling is like England's captain now and lifting lifting the Euros as we speak. You say an alternate universe, I've literally got that football manager saved somewhere. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Lord's disc and off we go. Dan Gosling's at home now playing it playing it out. Um, lads, it, it's 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 just nice to talk about Newcastle winning. I think we all agree. Nice. Um, but we, we can't really talk about it much more. It was 4-1. Um, I, I, I still believe that it's 4-0 because we're not, we're not having it, Don, Dan Gosling. We're not having it. Um, you, you don't exist. Um, it, it's black and white, not red and black. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to rile them up for the next game we play, but it won't happen because they'll be in the championship. Uh, this has been Extra Time. Um, Adam, Liam, uh, Doug, thank you so much. I'm going to eat this Chinese now. And, um, and oh, what, what's that? Oh, that's a great point to end on. Good night. <laughs>